At this time, will you please welcome back Apostle Jeff Inglehart as he comes to minister. Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate you all. Well, we have been, we have been talking about um, the Extraordinary Faith series, and we've been talking about the life of Elijah, and we've been learning a lot of life lessons about faith with Elijah. Remember in James it said that he was an ordinary man just like we are, which is just phenomenal for me to think about that James said he was just an ordinary man because he did phenomenal things and he even overcame phenomenal obstacles in his life. And uh, we want to, we want to talk, continue that today, but uh, have you ever been bewildered, distraught, or even weary? <laughs> Anybody? Have you ever been distraught? Be weird, weird, you know what I'm saying? You just feel like, man, I'm bewildered. I, I'm, I'm, I'm weary. I'm tired. I'm ready to walk out the door. You know what I'm saying? And I think we all go through seasons in our life that is like that. But if you're, if you're having one of these days, check this out because I think this video sums it up. Okay, God. You want me to talk to you? I talk back. Tell me what's going on. What should I do? Give me a signal. I need your guidance, Lord. Please send me a sign. Oh, what's this joker doing now? Okay. All right. I'll try it your way. All right. Lord, I need a miracle. I'm desperate. I need your help, Lord. Please reach into my life. Uh, what the? Oh, yeah. I got you. Have you ever had a day like that? Maybe you've had a week like that. Maybe you've had a month like that. Just don't stay in a season, another season past that. I'm just telling you. The truth of the matter is, is the person that we've been, the life we've been studying of Elijah, he had three and a half years like that. Now I want you to think about that. Even though God was providing in his life, even though there was peace in his life, even though there was joy in his life at times, he was still going through this whole woe is me thing. And then and all of a sudden he gets up to, he gets up to uh, uh, you know, the, uh, let me back up and let me tell you a little bit. First of all, Elijah, remember, he was the man that came into, into the city and he declared to the whole nation, he said, it's not going to rain for three and a half years because you're worshiping Baal, the wrong God. And God is the only true God, and he's the only one that can allow it to rain. So for three and a half years, it's not going to rain. It's just not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. Whoa, that's pretty, that's pretty bold, isn't it? And all of a sudden, he, he, then he left. He left the city. They thought, yeah, okay, he's nuts. They allowed him to leave the city. He left the city. And God took him into the Jordan, over to cross the Jordan, and just outside of the, of the king's reach. It was just outside of the king's reach. And some things that we learned, and you can look up here, this is what we've been learning so far about the life of Elijah. We've learned so far that faith expects the unexpected. Elijah was expecting the unexpected in his life. 
When the ravens came to feed him, how many know that is the unexpected, isn't it? Then he also, also he moved in obedience. When God told him to do something, he did it. Even if it didn't make sense, he just did it because how many know that obedience is better than sacrifice? Then he, his faith was persistent. He had persistent faith. He continued to move on no matter what the circumstances looked like. No matter, you know, the drought was starting to come. The, the, the brook that the brook Cherith that was, he was at was dried up. And then he got moved from there. He went to a widow's house because God told him, now I want you to move to this widow. And, I want, and she's going to take care of you there. And she had a son. And uh, she had her last, bit, you, you, many of you know the story. She had her last ounce of meal to make, to make a cake and her last bit of oil, to a last cruise of oil to make a cake. They're both going to eat it and then they're going to die. And he says, feed me first. I don't know about you, but if it's my son or somebody I don't know, I'm going to be like, well, this is my son. Or, you know. But she did. She made him the cake. And for the entire time of the rest of the drought, there, her oil never ran out. Her meal never ran out. That was a miracle. Then as with the story goes on, we know that her, that her son, her son dies. Now, if you're a widow in that time, you need to understand it's very important that if your son is alive, you have provision. But if your son dies, you are now out on the streets begging for your next loaf of bread. And what we learned about that is he went up to the upper room, he laid, out, he laid out on the child, on the dead child's body, and he said three times, life, come back into this body, come back into this body. And so we learned that faith allows the power, to, faith is persistent. That's what we learned about that is faith is persistent. He didn't give up after one time saying it, two times saying it, three times, finally by the third time, life came back into that, that boy's body. Faith also allows the power to wait and the power to persevere. You have to understand that he was in a time of waiting in his life. He was in a time of waiting, and he had to continue to wait. And he's like, God, what are you doing? Have you ever been in that mode where you're waiting? You're wondering, what is God doing in all this? I'm telling you what, it has something to do with your faith. Because I, just like I said before we even started this journey of, of leaving the other building and even coming here, I said it's going to be about the journey and not about the destination. And some are strong enough to handle the journey, and some are not strong enough to handle the journey. I, I, want us, I want us to look at this this morning. Because it says that faith allows us the power to wait and the power to persevere. Then we learn that faith allows you to see the miraculous. On, the, on that day, he, the Lord instructed him three and a half years to go back. He came back to the nation. They were all there with their, with their false prophets. And they, they got there. They built the, they built the altar. They put the sacrifice on the altar. All their gods prayed. Nothing happened. All the prophets prayed to, to Baal. Nothing happened. He then said, take your scarce water that is, so, that is so expensive. Dig a ditch, a trench around the altar, and douse the entire altar, the wood and everything, with water, which they did. And on that day, they saw the miraculous. And on the miraculous, what ended up happening is faith allowed them to see the miraculous because God came down and consumed the dust, the rocks, the stones, the wood, the sacrifice, everything, and all the water. The miraculous. Faith allows you to see the miraculous. Then after that, he thought, well, surely all Israel, they're all going to turn back to God, and they didn't. And so we learned that is that faith also faces disappointments. Just because you have disappointments in your life does not mean that you lack faith. It actually means that your faith is being tested in the disappointment. Think about that. Your faith is being tested in the midst of the disappointment. Then we learned that faith will face those disappointments. But today, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna realize that faith, today we're going to learn that faith will receive reassurance. Just, sometimes after disappointment, you get so disappointed and so heartbroken that you just want to throw in the towel. You want to give up. You want to walk away. Just like Bruce Almighty you know, he, he had a bad day that day. He was overlooked for the position, the, the pay raise that he was supposed to get. He was supposed to get, a, a, you know, a, he was supposed to get the, the better office at the job, and he got looked over. He got passed over, and he was so upset over that because he had been at the company for years, and he's like, God, when is it my turn? And then one thing after another just kept happening bad to him. So finally, you know, and then he had a fight with his, with his girlfriend, and he left the house, he left the, her, her, uh, saying her, and and uh, was in his car, and all of a sudden he's saying, God, where are you? Have you ever felt like that, saying, God, where are you? 
I want you to know that it's in times like that God, that God begins to whisper. He begins to whisper reassurance to your heart about your purpose, about your destiny. He starts to whisper things to you. That's what I want to talk to you about today because we're going to journey on with Elijah and his life again. My question to you this morning is, does God speak? And is it right to expect God to speak to us? Is it a right to expect God to speak to us? 1 Kings 19, 9 through 13, it says this. Remember last week, they found him underneath the tree, that God found him underneath the tree because he had ran away because he, in his mindset, all the prophets had been killed. All the good prophets of God had been killed. And he's like, God, I'm the only one. Hey, you know, we talked about the pity party last week that, hey, God, I'm the only one. There's no one else around me. And he went, he, he ran away and he hid himself underneath a bush. And we remember last week that, that God fed him, provided food for him, made him a meal. And when he woke up, he woke up to a hot meal. And God told him, eat this, you're going to need this for your strength to continue your journey. God is always there to reassure us, to guide us. We pick up from, from on his journey now, and in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9 through 13, there he went into a cave and spent the night. And at the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected the covenant, torn down the altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they are taking, they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, now he already said this conversation. He had this conversation earlier on in the chapter when he was under the bush and he was woke up. And God said, what are you doing here? He's already had the same conversation, but he decided to keep running. Instead, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? See, I do believe that God does speak to people today. Some of you heard this before, but I know that God spoke to me twice about my wife. I was seven years old the first time God said, you're going to marry her someday. I said, thank you, Jesus. I was, I was always this old person in a young person's body. You know what I'm saying? When I was younger. And um, then it was again when I was, was in my 20s. You're going to marry her. I'm like, great. Then she got married to somebody else. And I thought, well, I must be hearing something wrong. You know, God, I guess I just don't hear you. And then later on in my life, I, you know, I just kind of let it go and sit in a minister's conference. And all of a sudden, God says to me he's, again, he says, you're going to marry Denise. And I said, God, how can I marry somebody that's already married? They're married. And that's all he said, and, that's, and I never pursued it. I, I just sat there in amazement, and my good friend, Pastor Randy, put his arm around me and said, God just showed you who you're going to marry. God gave him a word of knowledge at that time. And I says, well, I'm not going to do anything with it. Six months later, I found out that Denise had gone through a really bad divorce, and um, her husband was on crack and heroin and just all kinds of other things, and uh, put her daughter's life at risk. And... Um, we got reacquainted during that time and formed friendship. And, well, you know, guess who I married? You know, God spoke to me about my kids. God spoke to me about the church several times. God spoke to me in, about board meetings. He spoke to me about meetings I was going to attend and people were going to attack something that was on the agenda because I serve on a few different boards. And, and so God already prepared me for those things that when I walked in the boardrooms, I already knew what was going to happen, what was going to come up. You see, even, even <laughs> I know people, people think they're surprised at me or whatever when they say, hey, we're, we're, we're heading out. I, I'm not surprised because usually weeks or months before I hear it, I just don't want to receive it. Do you know what I'm saying? 
So what I do is, is God, that's God's way of, of tempering my spirit and saying, bless them. So every person that, that moves out from the embassy, I bless. I bless them. And I bless those who remain in the embassy because you're the ones that are going to see the fruition of what God's promised. And you're going to enjoy the fruit of the labor that, that you're putting in. God is good. He is faithful all the time. So I know that, you know, even God told me about my kids and, and how I was going to have two girls. They weren't going to be in my seed. And I was going to have a, a girl and then I was going to have a boy and it was going to happen in that order. And so there's all things that God wants to, he wants to tell you about things about the future that are coming up in your life. He wants to tell you about the good. He wants to tell you about the bad. And he wants to tell you about the ugly. But I also say this to you. If you're just relying on God for direction in your life all the time, maybe there's something more. You see, Elijah was constantly relying on God for direction, and he would move where God told him to move. But God was after something more than that. And I thought today about Veterans Day, and I thought, you know what? Here Elijah felt he was a veteran, but he felt like he was the only one that was left. That the whole company of prophets were taken out. His whole platoon was gone. And he felt like, God, I'm the only one left remaining and so he felt he had to get to a safe place and so he ran and he went to a cave and God met him in that cave and he whispered to him what are you doing here I like what John chapter 17 verse 24 through 26 says it says father I want those who you have given to me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world Righteous Father, through the world, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order, get this key, that the love you have for me may be in them. And I myself be in them. You see, what I realized is Elijah was going through something. He was going through a hard time in in what God was asking him to do, and, and he did it. He, he always was obedient in doing what God told him to do. But it got to the point where he was frustrated because he thought, okay, God, when you consume the altar, you're going to show up, show off, and everyone's going to understand that this is, this is the amazing thing about it. This is what God is, is done. This is what he's doing, and wow, and everybody's going to turn back to you. And that's, that's not what happened. You see, sometimes God is, even though he speaks things into our hearts, he's not going to do it in our timelines, and he's not going to do it the way we thought or the way we planned it. He's always going to do something differently than that. And what, and what God is after is he's after the love in our hearts, that our love would remain for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, even for those that are in this body and even other bodies of believers, that our love remains intact. God longs to reveal himself to us. That is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. It's that he reveals the Father to us. God wants to speak to us about things that are yet to come because he's in our future. Did you know that God is already in your future? I'm so glad that God is already in my future. And I'm somewhere in my future and I look a whole lot better than I look right now. Aren't you glad about that? God is in your future. I want you just to think about, I just want you to think about the last 10 years of your life. Just think of the last 10 years of your life and think of all the things that you've overcome in the last 10 years and all the things that God's done in your life and done for you and done for your family and you realize, you know what? God was in my future and he was just waiting for me to catch up because God always orders the steps of a righteous person, the person that's doing things right. How amazing is that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What I've, what I've also realized is, is that not only does God want to speak to us things that are yet to come, but I'm reminded of, of Hilda Buntain. Thank you, Pastor Nikki. She posted this a week ago on the, on the Facebook page, and it said this. It said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never trust 
an unknown future, or never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. I love that. For someone to go through the Holocaust, go through the concentration camps, even lose their loved ones, and be able to come out on the other end and say, trust God. Trust your future to God. But more than, than God giving us direction in life, is that God desires our friendship. God desires our friendship. You see, what, what got me about Bruce is I was having, I was having uh, I, I've had a couple uh, weeks like Bruce. And I could, totally, I could totally understand how he was feeling, the frustration that he was feeling. And I've even yelled a couple times at God, it's okay to do that. Did you know that? He's, he's big enough to handle that. And... Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I shouted out some frustrations that I had, and, you know, um, and, and it was starting to go down the way of a pity party. You know, well, God, I'm spending all this time, I'm investing all this time and, and money and even my efforts, and, you know, you just start going down this wrong road. And, and God whispers to me, he says, Jeff, he said, I've showed you things to come. I want you to rest right there in the things I've showed you to come. But right now, I want your friendship. He said, I'm not going to give you direction for tomorrow yet. I just want your friendship. I want to share what's on my heart to you. Guys, somewhere along the line, I missed that it was about, that it was about a friendship and not just being told what to do and do it. It's not just about obedience. It's about a relationship. It's not just about following what God wants you to do. It's about a relationship with the Father. And that's what he desires for every one of us. That's what he was desiring to get through to the prophet Elisha. Elisha, I want your friendship. Yes, you've been obedient. Yes, you've been doing these things. And I, and I, and I just thought, wow. God wants and desires our friendship. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he calls us friends, that we're friends of God. Elijah feels a discouragement partially because he didn't see the outcome that he wanted to see. God speaks in various ways and in times and all that wants us to listen to him. He may not talk to you about things that he wants in the ways that you want it but he wants to speak to you regardless in your heart. He wants to, you to listen to that whisper that he wants to whisper and tell you things. is isn't a relationship and a friendship, isn't it, where friends get together and friends don't always tell you what to do? Because if you're in that kind of a relationship that your friend is always telling you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, it's no longer a friendship, it's a dictatorship. And I was blown away. I was like, I get it. I get it. Jesus said this. He said, in John chapter 6, 63, it says this. The Holy Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Guys, the words that the Spirit of God speaks to us, those are the things that bring us life. Yes, his word brings us life. Yes, the Bible is full of, of, of who God is and his character and how he never gives up on us and how he's always faithful. His word is always there to show us things and to reveal things to us. But he wants to go, he even wants to speak to your heart every day not just from the word, but he wants to declare things to your spirit because he wants to be your friend. Not just your God, not just your savior, not just the one that's telling you, go here, go here, do this, do that, but he wants to be your friend. He was trying to reestablish that relationship and he was going after Elisha and he's like, Elisha, I want to be your friend. The question we kind of said this, we even said this last week, and I put it up on the screen, and, and um, I had these printed off, and I will have them here next Sunday. I walked out of the house, and I totally forgot about it, but it's which voices are you listening to, 
And I changed it a little bit because I realized that it's the Spirit of God speaking into your mind or it's your carnal mind. It's not the devil because the devil can't be everywhere at once. It's your carnal fleshly desires. It's your selfish desires. It's your carnal mind. And, but, if you, but if you give way to these things, then it opens up yourself to give place to the enemy in your life. Does that make sense? And you can look at the screen and you can see those things. Uh, you know, the spirit calms, the carnal mind obsesses. The spirit comforts, the carnal mind worries. The spirit convicts, the carnal mind condemns. The spirit encourages, the carnal mind discourages. The spirit enlightens, the carnal mind confuses. The spirit gives faith, the carnal mind has, reacts to fear. The, the spirit leads, the carnal mind pushes. The spirit reassures, the carnal mind frightens. The spirit stills and the carnal mind rushes. You see, he speaks through the Bible, through thoughts, feelings. Matter of fact, even creation, the Bible says that all creation shows and reveals the glory of God. He also speaks through dreams, he speaks through visions, audible voice. And I just want to show you some of the scriptures to go along with some of the things I just said. Acts chapter 15, 28 says, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit not to be burdened with you, I burdened, burdened you with anything beyond the following requirements. You see, what the, the key there is it seemed good to the Holy Spirit, meaning, meaning they were impressed by the Holy Spirit. There was an impression, there was a feeling they felt that the Holy Spirit was good with this. It was an impression. While they prayed, they heard it seemed good to them. It was an impression by the Holy Spirit. Your natural senses are only a picture of your spiritual senses. So if God has given you eyes, he wants, to see, he, he wants you to see visions. He wants you to he give you a mind, he wants you to dream dreams. He's given you an ear, he wants you to hear. He's given you eyes, he wants you to be able to see. He's given you a mouth, the word says taste and see that the Lord is good. There are so many different scriptures. I, I, like, I, like what, um, I like God's word will always back up your senses, your thoughts, your feelings, your impressions, your dreams, your visions. He's not going to show you something or share with something that's contrary to the scripture. Does that make sense? So when God's speaking to you in your senses and you're feeling these things, you're feeling feelings, thoughts, impressions, dreams, visions, all these things, he's always going to back it up with the scripture. He's never going to give you something that's not in the word. Job chapter 33, 15 through 16 says, In a dream of vision of night, one of my, one may hear God's voice. When deep sleep falls on men while slumbering upon their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. See, he's speaking to us in our dreams. Hearing God's voice is not about him telling you what to do all the time. It's about that he wants a partnership. He wants a relationship. He wants a friendship. And he wants to tell you what's on his heart. You know, this week when I was listening to him, you know what I heard? Jeff, you're exactly doing what I want you to do. You're staying on the course that you're exactly on. I don't want you to be, I don't want you to look to the left nor to the right. I don't want you to be confused. I want you to take courage. Because what's, what's in your future looks so much better than your present or your past. He began to just tell me things, uh, things about me and about my heart. He said, you know, the, 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 there's, some, there's, some real, there's some real heart issues that, that are in your life. And he said, I, I just want to talk to him. And this is what's on my heart. And can you find it in your heart to make sure that those things are also in yours? So over the last three days, that, that's exactly where I've been. That's actually the last four days. Saying, God, what's on your heart? Reveal to me what's on your heart. Because I want a friendship. I want that relationship. More than just receiving instruction to say, okay, God, where are you taking us? Where are we going? What's next? What do you want me to do next? Because that was always my big question. And God is just saying, Jeff, I want your friendship in this season right now. And I said, you got it. You got it. Hearing God's voice is not about telling you what to do all the time. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1 it says this, I will take my stand and I watch at the watch post at the station at the tower and I will look out to see what he will say to me. 
See, God wants to use your eyes to look around to see what God is saying to you. He wants to use your senses to say, hey, someone's hurting over here. Hey, somebody's hurting over there. He wants to use you for the, with your senses to see what God is saying to you. He wants to reveal something to you through your, through your vision. I also like what Acts chapter 16, 6 through 10 says. Paul was going to Asia and God closed the doors. God just closed the doors. He said, well, God, I'm, I'm headed to Asia. I'm, you know, we're going to do a great work for you in Asia. And God just <laughs> shut the door. And we think, well, what, what was up with that? But let's look at Acts chapter 16, 6 through 10 says, it says, now when they had gone through Phrygia, thank you, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Do you know, do you know I, I, went and, I went and looked at a couple buildings because I was, I was just like, you know, God, this is, this is a great place here, but, um, and he says, stay. I said, okay. Went and looked at a couple buildings, and as I'm walking through those buildings, God said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm just checking it out. <laughs> I'm just checking it out. I just want you to, I want everyone to know that I've been doing due diligence, and I'm just checking out of the things. He says, that's not what I told you. So you need to understand that in my own carnal mind, I've been checking things out when God says no. I'm just as human as you are. I desire a bigger foyer where everybody can congregate. I desire, I desire a real nursery for our kids. I desire, you know, a whole, a whole center for our, our, our youth and our, and our kids that they, they can grow in, in God and, and, and fun and just all kinds of things. Those things are coming. Those things are coming. Thank you, God, for the reassurance. Thank you for what your word says. But it says that they were stopped by the Holy Spirit. And then if you look down at, at, at uh, the next verse, it says, And a vision appeared to Paul that night. A man from Macedonia stood pleading with him, saying, Come over here to Macedonia and help us. You see, if God closes one door, he's going to open up another door in your life. And don't fear the door. Don't fear the door when he, when he closes it. Don't try to push through the door. Trust me, it'll, it, won't, it won't do you any good to try to push through a door, to try to shove a door open. It just, it's going to be fruitile. It's going to frustrate you. It's going to waste your time. Just take it from me. All right? Wait for the open doors. They're going to happen. Just like the doors open for us to come here. They happened. Just like the doors open for an office, for storage space. You know, thank God. God opens up doors. He places it on people's hearts to be benevolent and, and to be giving. And thank you, Jesus. Matter of fact, I, I, think, I think that scripture ends out with concluding that the Lord had called them to preach the gospel with them and great things happened in Macedonia. How fantastic is that? God is good. God doesn't want to just tell you what to do. He wants to reassure you of who you are, what you're doing. He wants a friendship with you. He wants a relationship with you. Yes, obedience is important, but beyond the obedience, he wants that relationship with you. And when you're in that relationship, you can stand firm and you can stand strong because you know, hey, God's got this. God's got this. The embassy band's coming back at this time, and they're coming back up. And I, I don't know about you, but I've really been appreciating them and the harmony and the, and the, and the backup singers. And oh, my goodness. Guys, we appreciate you all. Thank you for leading us in worship on Sundays and, and the fine job that you do and allowing the Holy Spirit to, to use you your gifts, talents, and abilities. I want to close this morning by asking you a question. And maybe, and maybe, it's, um, maybe it's not really a question. Maybe it's just, I want you to ask God this. Ask God this. God, I'm not sure what you want me to say to me today, but I'm going to listen through my senses. 
I want you to take a quick inventory of your life today and I really want to ask you the question, when is the last time you carved out time or put time on your agenda just to sit and listen? Just to sit and listen to what the Holy Spirit wants to download to you. What God wants to speak to you into your heart through the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what's on his heart, what's on his mind. So ask yourself the question, God, I'm not sure what you want me to say today, but I'm going to listen through my senses. Holy Spirit, I want you to speak to me today. I thank you for your guidance and direction. But most of all, I'm humbled. I'm humbled by the friendship that you desire to have with each of us and with me. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you that you're a friend who stays closer than a brother. That's what the Bible says. You're a friend that stays closer than a brother. Today, God, there's not one person in this room that doesn't need you more today than they did yesterday. Matter of fact, there are people in this room that are have questions in their mind and they're they're asking for direction in their life. And you want to give them that direction, but first you want to just be their friend. You want to give them some relationship. You want to just tell them what's on your heart and you want to hear what's on their heart and what's on their mind. And thank you for loving us today. You see, my friends, God was saying to Elisha, there are things that I want to deal with in your heart. I'm excited about next Sunday. Because when God gets intimate with you, he's not there to strike you down. You know, poor Bruce on the, on the film, he thought, okay, God Almighty, strike me down. I'm tired of this life. I'm tired of living. And God is saying, I don't want to strike you down. I want to lift you up. I don't want to strike you down. I want to raise you up. I want to have that relationship, that one-on-one relationship with you. Let me say this to you. Maybe, maybe God wants to speak to you about something that he thinks is more important than the thing you're asking him about. Maybe you're asking him about something because that's on your mind and that's in your heart and that's right in your face. But maybe there's something else that resides in your heart that he wants to unlock, he wants to open because he knows that it's going to supersede what's on your mind. That it's actually going to be something that's going to be better for you, that's going to take you to a better place, to a higher place in him and even in your life in the future. But he's got to talk to you about your heart first. Yeah. Maybe you've been running from God, or maybe you think you are not spiritual enough to hear his voice. (laughs) I just gave you all the ways and all the different senses that he wants to speak to you. So if you don't think you hear his voice then you better start recording your dreams because he's going to break through while you're asleep on your bed and he's going to start showing you and revealing things to you. Because it's not about how spiritual you are, believe it or not. God doesn't have a measuring stick out measuring your spirituality. He loves you. He created you. And every creator that creates wants a relationship with its creation. He wants to make sure its creation is working the way and functioning the way that it was created to function and to be and to operate. So you don't have to be good enough. 
He wants to be your friend today. I don't know about you, but that's good news to me. That in the midst of life, he's, he wants to be my friend. In the midst of, of thoughts of failure, he wants to be my friend. In the midst of, of tragedy, in the midst of whirlwinds, in the midst of storms, he wants to be my friend. And I'm thankful for that. Elijah's thankful for that. And I think that's great that God didn't just leave him under a bush, didn't leave him by a brook, didn't leave him at a widow's house. He kept going after him and kept moving him, kept chasing him, kept preparing for him, kept providing for him. And even in a cave, met him in a cave to whisper, just to whisper, what are you doing in here? Next week. Can't wait for next week. It's going to be good. We just stand up with me this morning. I'm going to ask the ministry prayer response team members to come and to pray. And the elders are going to be here too to pray with you. If you have a need in your life or, or um, maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you're dealing with some heaviness today. I, I, I sense there's some other people that are here that are heavy hearted today. And if you're dealing with some heaviness in your heart today, come on down. We're, we're going to pray with you. Don't, don't walk out of this building with a heavy heart. But walk out knowing that God wants to be your friend. And that the joy is going to be restored to you, that God has great plans for your life. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you that you bless us on our coming in. You bless us on our going out. Thank you for the freedom that you've given to us and the price that was paid by Christ. Thank you also, Lord, for the, for the many, the brave who have fought and continue to fight courageously for our freedom so we can have the freedom here to worship and to praise you and to bless you and to honor you and to share you with other people. Thank you, Father God. We ask that you would just bless their families, bless their health, bless them as much as you're blessing us. And this week, God, I thank you that we're going to go out. I thank you that you're going to be there to reassure us all through our week because you want to be our friend. Help us to be reassurers even in other people's lives to just be a blessing to other people around us. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Have a fantastic week.